All right, my friends, we are back with JBL, Jim Garrett. It's been a while since we've seen each other, man. It's always great to have you on the channel. How are you doing today? I'm great, Gene. How are you? I'm doing all right. You know, the last time we met, it was at the Audio Advice live show last summer. You guys put on a freaking stellar demo with JBL, HDI, and Synthesis. So you had kind of both systems merged into one. I think it was a 7.2. 2.4 setup, if I'm not mistaken, or 5.2.4 setup. Right? Uh, it, it was seven, correct? Two subs. There were no height channels in that room. There were no height channels, but you know what? Um, Everybody thought there was, <laughs> but no. Yeah, I think yeah. I tricked myself into thinking that there were height channels. Yep. What blew me away about that system, and we have several reviews of the JBL series, the HDI series speakers, I think are some of the best value today in loudspeakers. I think JBL really hit it out of the park with that series. And that subwoofer, the 1200p sub, we were just talking about it. I think that's a sleeper sub for you guys because it's it's not an output monster, but the numbers don't tell everything because you only had two of those subs in a fairly large room. The bass was so tight and articulate, I didn't find myself wanting at all. And they're absolutely gorgeous looking subwoofers. They blend into the room decor. So I'm I'm a huge fan of those subs and a huge fan of the HDI series in general. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's good stuff. We're proud of those. And they sounded really good in that room. Yeah, they really did. So now you've got some new JBL stuff that you announced at CES. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to make that. We were supposed to do a live stream months ago, but there was a lot of <laughs> stuff going on that our schedules didn't coincide with each other. But I'm yep. always happy to have you on the channel. I want you guys, I want you to just drop some knowledge about the new JBL stuff, especially classic is kind of like a sentimental thing to me because I grew up with old school JBL. I had LX44s, I had the L100 T3s. I'm talking years ago, like 80s and 90s era JBL. That's that's how I remember the brand. And I always had a fondness for them uh, just because I love the sound of live music and I loved what JBL was bringing. So you're kind of bringing that back now, only with updated driver technology. We did a review, I think, of the L100s or the L80s. I think it was the L100s. Yeah, uh, I can't remember exactly which one we did. I've got both sitting behind me. You see a little peek uh, there. That orange one is an L100, and there's an L82 back here as well, too. Uh, And then this little guy is an L52, but that's from the Black Edition that we announced last fall that just became available. Uh, it, we were talking about Expona a few minutes ago. I think they had a couple of the Black Edition products at Expona too. So a yeah. lot going on with the classic loudspeakers. It's been a great series for us. No, they are great products. And I got the chance to hear a couple of demos at different locations. I really like the L100s, particularly the 12-inch three-way. That's just, again, another special speaker with such an iconic past and, and a heritage to itself. And I love the fact that you're keeping this alive, only you're updating driver technology and you're you're keeping everything current in terms of performance. Yep. So so now the new one that you just talked about is a smaller version of that speaker. Is that the one that ships with a sub? You guys pair that with a subwoofer? Well, yeah, we uh, introduced, uh, I would call it Papa Bear, Mama Bear, Baby Bear, as we went down the size scale of the uh, Classic Series loudspeakers. So L100 was the first, that's the 12 inch three way. And then we had the L82s, the eight inch two way. The L52, the little guy there is a five and a quarter inch uh, true, you know, bookshelf modern in modern uh, vernacular. And that has been uh, a great speaker for us because it brings all of the classic design, but it's, you know, a much tidier form factor than what the other guys are. And so that's been a good one. What we introduced at CES this year, and I will uh, actually give you a little look at it here. So that guy right there is the L10 CS. And so what we did is we introduced a classic series subwoofer to the product range. So we have uh, not only the small bookshelf there, the L52, uh, we also have the L75 MS, which is the all-in-one music system that we introduced last year. And so those were great products for us to add a subwoofer to. And we created this guy in the same you know, design as the rest of the range. So you can see it's got the natural walnut wood veneer on it. Uh, What what you can't see up underneath is a 10 inch Mm -hmm. down firing white cone woofer. Uh, So it's been a great addition to the range. We actually make a uh, black version of it too. So that goes with some of the studio monitor speakers that we have. Uh, And then it's in a black walnut version. So So is that a uh, sealed sub or is it ported? It's ported. It's ported. Okay. Yeah, it's there's uh, twin ports on the back side of it, and then again, it's a down firing 
uh, driver, a white cone, uh, 10 inch down firing driver. So what's the uh, price on that sub? Uh, 700 bucks, 699 in the U S so, okay. uh, real wood veneer, 500 watt peak power amp, the, all the basic functions and controls on it. It's a great sub. And what we have, what you were mentioning, uh, we've been doing some subset demos with the little L52 and the right. subwoofer and they, they make a great package. You know, so retail in the U.S. that's seventeen hundred bucks for those. If you buy the matching floor stands, uh, another three hundred bucks. So for two grand, you get something that's going to outperform a lot of you know comparably priced uh, floor standers because you're going to get the deep bass out of the sub, and then of course you get the cool aesthetic that all these classic series have with the retro design. So uh, I think that's a that's a cool one. So yeah, do you see my screen right now? I do indeed. Yeah. So, so this was at Expona a couple of weeks ago. Yep, that's a black edition. So we introduced those uh, last fall. They've just become available in retailers earlier this year. So in that case, as cool as this design is, you know, that retro look of these with the, you know, natural walnut and the grill colors that you can get in orange and blue and black, it's cool, but you may find that that's not my interior decor and yeah. it's really not going to match it, which is too bad because I love the speaker. Well, what we did was, we said, let's dress these things up for a night on the town. And so the black edition is a piano, you know, piano black, high gloss painted finish on them. Uh, we did the Henry Ford approach, the grill's black, any color you want, as long as it's black. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the badge on the front on the grill is a special gold badge. The logo's on the front. Um, again, you might be able to see it here. As a matter of fact, let me uh, point it out here, but there's a uh, the attenuator controls around them have a special gold badge and the same thing on the back near the input terminals. So they look really cool and it really makes it a much more sophisticated, modern look to the speaker. Uh, we offer it on all three of the passive speakers. So the L52, the L82 and the L100, the picture you just showed. Yeah. And then you can get the L75, the all-in-one music system. You can get the finish in that one as well. Okay. So how, how much is the, uh, the the new one? The L, is this the L52 that we're looking at, you said? Yeah, so $1,000 in the standard finish. They're $1,250 in the black edition, which is the custom high gloss black with the uh, right. unique accent colors on it. I will point out uh, where you showed the L100, which was there at Expona. I, I, I As a car guy, I call the, the black edition is the appearance package, and that's the high gloss look and all the gold trim details. The L100 we're looking at on the screen, as well as the L82, have what we call the performance pack. So those actually have upgraded transducers from the standard L100 and L82 versions. They have revised crossover networks, and they also have an, a very nice high-end input cup on the back with dual sets of gold-plated uh, binding posts. So you can do a bi-wire configuration, whereas the standard L100 uh, that we've offered for the last several years is just a single uh, wire input on it. So, oh, I didn't. I didn't know you made performance upgrades to this. So, how do you differentiate this speaker from the original L100 from like a couple of years ago? I mean, is there a is there a special marking on the model number or revision or something? Yeah, right now the Black Edition version is that version. So oh, we've okay. offered, yeah, we've offered a couple different variants of the speaker since it came out. You might remember a couple of years ago for the 75th anniversary, we did a, a L100 Classic 75 that was an anniversary edition. And uh -huh. that had a special wood veneer finish and it came in a, you know, serial eye. We made 750 pair globally. They all came with serial numbers and a special wooden crate. But we made acoustic improvements at that time, which was where the acoustic improvements in this L100 Black Edition came from. So from an acoustic standpoint, this is basically the same um, transducers and network and input terminals what we had on the 75, uh, the anniversary version. So, but this is a radically different look with the piano black finish on it and the black grill and all these other details. So, yeah, I, I really like it. I think it looks kick ass. Um, tell me about the amplifier that's powering it. What is that? Yeah. So, when we did that 75th anniversary product, uh, one of the things that we wanted to create was a unique amplifier to go with it because you have this decidedly retro style in the loudspeaker. And we thought, well, why not make a very modern amplifier that's got today's features and connectivity and whatnot, but make it look like it came from the 60s or the 70s. So that was the SA750 that we did, originally intended to be a limited edition product. Uh, and it had the same teak wood side panels, which I think in that picture, that one does. That's That looks to be a 75th anniversary one. Um, 
it was popular enough we decided to keep it. It's a great amplifier to, to mate with the L100s. Um, and now what we did at CES was we announced a complete range of classic series electronics. And that's uh, sitting behind me in the room. I've got a couple of them here. Um, a lot of the samples that we have are actually, were just shipped over to our England office as they're going to the Munich show. <laughs> so oh, okay. uh, from a timing standpoint, I didn't quite have everything here to show you. But so now so, we have two amps in the range. So yeah. this one that we're looking at now, is this is this um, like a class G multi-rail? Correct. Topology, yes. okay. Yep. Kind of like what RCAM does, similar to that. Yep, it's the same amplifier technology we use in the RCAM products, yeah. So you okay. get that high current class A capability um, and it's you've got that second set of rails, so you get more power when you need it. Does it have a DAC too? Uh, yes, it does. So the 750 actually has streaming integrated into it, high res DAC, a lot of connectivity um, that, you know, phono input, moving magnet, moving coil, those types of things. Sweet. The new version that we announced at CES this year is the SA550. And part of the reason we did that was this amp you're looking at 3300 in the US, which is priced right really for the L100s, but it becomes a an expensive proposition when you're looking at the smaller classic speakers. So the new SA550 doesn't have streaming in it, but it does have high res Bluetooth connectivity. Mm -hmm. So you can still connect it that way. It's still got a G class amp, but it's a little less power. Still has a phono preamp in it, but it's moving magnet only. So you get a lot of those same details and it looks, you know, like it came from the 1970s. I, it, this is maybe not the way to do it, but if you look behind me in there, <laughs> that is on top an SA750 and right below it's the SA550. And then you can also notice right here is the classic series CD player that we introduced. And uh, there's also a classic series streamer. And that's a cool piece because there were a lot of people that have come up to us at shows and have said, you know, that's a piece that looks decidedly retro 60s, 70s era. But now I get this modern streaming capability with Chromecast and AirPlay 2 and whatnot. So that's a cool piece. And then, of course, we did a, a turntable was the other one that we announced as part of this range. I do not have that one here. It's on its way to Germany uh, for the Munich show. Mm -hmm. But um, those I are all pieces. The, I see the, Sade, uh, the Sade record on the, on the bottom over there. That's a good <laughs> yes. One. Well, and I do have I have the Bluetooth turntable behind me, which is another one we introduced at the show. That's a completely different story. But these classics, you know, if for anybody that's a JBL historian or geek that knows some of the old products, uh, we designed those specifically based on the SA 600 and 660 that were out in like the late 1960s, early 1970s. So that's where the, the, the brushing on the front panel, vertical and horizontal, and the switch gear was all uh, designed to really pay homage to the uh, uh, those JBL products from the 60s, which is why they all, if you've noticed the detail, they all have the 60s JBL logo on them too. So Yeah, I saw that. That's awesome. Uh, That's do these amps stuff. have, do these amps have subwoofer out? Uh, yes, they both do. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any PEQ capability if someone uh, beyond just tone controls? Uh, no, we do not. We have a uh, Dirac on the SA750. We oh, do not great. have okay. it on the 550. Right. Yeah. Okay. And when you use the Dirac, uh, you could limit the bandwidth. So you're just correcting below 500 Hertz. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as, uh, as I think about this too, uh, I think this it's a pre-op that we use on the back to connect to a sub. I don't think it's a, uh, uh, dedicated subwoofer output. So I got you. So you have, to, me, put, you, you have to apply yeah. your own base management. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're, you know, got a sub like one of these, you just use the crossover that's in it. So, yep. Yeah, that's cool. So I wanted to ask you about uh, another speaker that was at Expone. I hope you don't mind. Let me pull this back up again. Let me scroll down to where did I pass it? Yeah, we did have we multiple go. rooms there at the show. So, uh, so I know you we're have, going. <laughs> so this looks a lot like the HDI series. I mean, I know it's not, it's not, it's the Studio 698, but is this based on the HDI series, only just more cost reduced? Uh, no, not really. Uh, from an acoustic standpoint, it's actually based on the old Studio 5 series. Um, from a design standpoint, it mimics more the shape of the HDI. So what you're kind of getting is, a more affordable version of the HDIs, but it's not quite the same advanced transducer technology that's in it. Great uh -huh. speakers. These are, uh, it's a vinyl wrap cabinet rather than a real wood veneer, but yeah. you can see the finish options in them. They look really nice. And they've got the same 
you know, subtle curvatures to them and the, and the heavy radius around the uh, corners of them. So you get that really modern look and they've got a nice clean magnetically attached grill that goes on the front, clearly not seen in this photo. Um, and then if you look up top in this one, you'll see while it's got an HDI uh, horn waveguide on it, the compression driver is the one that was used in the Studio 5. So it's an older uh, compression driver, like a one inch phenolic type compression driver in it, as opposed to what HDI uses, which is the newer patented annular ring diaphragm uh, compression drivers. And then these are um, a pure pulp uh, cone woofer, whereas we use the advanced aluminum matrix in the uh, HDI series. These are steel frame versus cast frame. So there's definite step ups between the two. These yeah. are considerably uh, lower priced than the HDIs. They run, you know, I think a little less than half the price in the US. Yeah, they're like 1700 a pair. And these are, are, these, are these a three way or are they two? They're still. That's a, you, yeah, that's a dedicated three way, twin eights with a six inch mid and a one inch yeah. compression driver up top. Yeah, that's and the, the wave biggest. Guide on the, the wave guide on the tweeter looks very similar to HDI. That's why it I, is. I looked at this. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it is, but designed for that particular compression driver that's on it. But yes, it is. So where do you get this speaker? This would be more like you get it at a Best Buy or Magnolia kind of. Uh... Uh, it's still going to be, it's a little more expensive than what you'd find on a core floor at a, at a Best Buy store. But, um, you know, this is being rolled out to retailers around the country right now. So that would be uh, certainly one place that you want to look. I think they will carry it there. I'm, I will comment. I am not on the sales team for the U.S. side of it, so I'm not completely up to speed on all the details and where they're uh, at in their negotiations with partners right now. But this will be available at most of our, our major retail partners. And uh, not only that, a lot of our partners in the U.S. are uh, uh, offering products online as well, too. So. Well, I could tell you, James was impressed. I mean, I had him go to Expona a couple of weeks ago and I said, just cover the stuff that's really interesting. You know, I know you don't have a lot of time in one day, but he stopped by your booth and he wrote up some really nice stuff about the studio series. And of course the L 100s, he already heard and reviewed very favorably. So yeah, it's always great uh, to do. I always love going to your demo booths, especially when you did Cedia one year, you guys had a full M2 speaker system you were demoing DTS X with uh, Nigel Pond. Nigel Pond, I think that uh, animatronics thing with seismatic. Oh, that was uh, yeah, well, yeah. That that, well, that goes back several years, but yeah, several years. That yeah. I know. I haven't been to CD in three years because of COVID and and hurricanes, and so we're talking probably five or six years ago. That was such a freaking demo, man. And you had the cool thing about that is I love the science you guys apply to reality. Is you had stack subwoofers in every corner you had two subs in every corner minimal um base trapping if any i don't even think you had any base trapping no but, there wasn't no and, but there was like five or six rows of seats and no matter mm -hmm. where i moved around in that room the base was uniform incredibly uniform and i think at the time you weren't even using direct you were using Harmon Soundfield Management, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, actually, that system would have been calibrated with Arcos, which was when we used to use the SDEC processors and synthesis. Mm -hmm. Arcos is basically, it was our own calibration system, but it was calibrated to the Harmon target curve. But yeah, that was a cool system. That was a, that was a very big theater. We haven't used that theater at CDO for quite some time, but it's that's a cool room for sure. Yeah. That was a great system. Speaking of CDO, are you guys going to have a, a demo kind of something like that at CEO going forward this year? Yeah, we've been, for the last couple of years, we've got a room that we've been using both at our CES event and at CEDIA that we can vary uh, between two rows and three rows of seats, but it's a 9.1, well, 9.4.6 uh, channel count. So not as, that system you heard was, I don't remember how many channels it was. It was that close was to lot. 30, I think. Yeah, <laughs> It was a very high channel count system. But yeah, we've been doing this, um basically a 16 channel system now uh for a couple of years and we've been showcasing some of the newer products that we have uh we were discussing you know before we started some of the newer jbl synthesis in wall and ceilings that we introduced a little over a year ago and so we've been showcasing those our compression driver and ceiling speakers and the, our flagship the scl2 which is the biggest end wall we make um, we do have uh, some reference products from synthesis that we introduced uh last year and we had those at Cedia last fall, um, but they're large enough that we don't, there's no way we can put a theater in a booth to support them. So, mm -hmm. so we had them out on static display, but they, they, uh, 
they attracted an awful lot of attention to people there. We had them on, on display at the front of the booth. And it's one of those things, I think, when people saw the press release or read about them, they're like, okay, those look cool. But it didn't give you an indication of the scale until you saw them in person. And you're like, that's some serious acoustic horsepower right there that you've created. So, yeah, yeah, those were fun. And we'll have those on display, static display at CD again this year. So the M2s are, you guys don't still sell the M2s anymore, right? Well, so it's always been uh, a product that was developed by the JBL professional side of the business because it was intended as its name. It was a master studio reference piece, um, and they designed that for professional studio monitor use. We co-developed our engineers on the luxury side. We helped, we kind of co-developed that product because JBL professional acoustic engineering is, is co-located with us here in the uh, Northridge facility. So... At that time, we didn't have a speaker that capable to use in the big sense systems. So we were using M2s for a number of years in some of the really high end synthesis systems. We've now made our own speaker, the SCL1, uh, that we use. Uh, so we don't we don't sell the M2 anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, we use the SCL1, which is a purpose built uh, product and is it's a monster. So I it's I think it's a, a better speaker than the M2 from a multi-channel cinema aspect of really what synthesis is intended for. So is that a passive version or is that an active version? It's passive. It does have a network in it, whereas the M2 did not, right? You, the yeah. M2, you had to use outboard active electronics. With the SCL1, we've actually given you the choice that way. It's got an incredible passive network in it. That's one of the most advanced networks you could probably put in a speaker. Mm -hmm. And you can use it that way if you want to. So you could do a single single wire input in it. You could buy wire it. Or we did give it the ability to go uh, active outboard electronics. So you could go straight into both drivers and completely bypass the crossover if you were you know, using like our SDP 75 processor and you want to do anechoic EQ setups and do it all outboard active, you could do it that way with that product. Are you guys going to have a demo of that either at Audio Advice or at Cedia that people can sit down and it's, listen to music on? No, not really because the scale of the, it's it's such a big speaker oh, okay. and the subwoofers that go with it are even bigger and that stuff's just too big and heavy to take to shows uh, it, and to create a cinema around it just gets even bigger and heavier. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, no, we don't have that. Now, our, unfortunately, uh, the vast majority of people that are here wouldn't be able to hear it, but for some of the members of the press that have been here to the Northridge campus, our JBL Synthesis Reference Cinema uh, has a complete high channel count system based around our, our best uh, JBL Synthesis products. And those are the LCRs in that room, and we have those mega subwoofers in there as well too it's well jim it i think you got i think you're gonna have to fly me out there for a demo because I'm, uh, I'm not convinced i'm not convinced you, you need to come on out to sunny southern california and we'll be happy to host you and give you a demo of that it is a, a a serious experience a visceral experience life changing mm -hmm. <laughs> all the superbola that you can put around it it's uh is it's a very impressive cinema I love that. So we have a question here. Maybe you can answer on JBL. sure. What is the sound signature difference between the old Studio Five and now the new Studio Six series? Uh, they are voiced a little bit differently. Obviously, the difference in the horns they're huge, right? If you remember what a Studio Five speaker looked like, it was a, a very large horn. That was also a much older um, 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 geometry that's in that horn. Sorry, having a senior moment for a second here and remembering my words, but um, the newer Studio 6 series follows the high definition imaging geometry that we use in the newer horns. And mm -hmm. that's for people to look in those horns rather than straight sided uh, horns in them, or I mean, they still have a radius, of course, but there's no details down on the throat. On all the HDI horns, you can see these diffraction ridges and things that are in there that really helped eliminate throat resonances, which is what the primary um, evolutionary change that came out of our horn designs with that. So that's what's in the Studio 6. So they look much more like the newer products that we've done. They look like HDI series. They look like the high-end studio monitors. So they use that geometry, whereas the older Studio 5 does not. And then I also mentioned, too, related to the horns, um, you know, we're using that same compression driver as the Studio 5. So it's a true compression driver. It's not a dome with a, you know, a lens or a face plug in front of it. It's a, it's a true uh, one-inch phenolic compression driver that we use in that product. And it's the same from 5 to 6 Studio oh, okay. Series. Yeah. So the waveguide is just what changes on that front. 
Yeah, it's a, a 2414 compression driver is the same in both of those, but if it attached to a very different uh, horn waveguide in the new products yeah. than what we had in the Studio 5s. So here's another question for you. Not, I don't know if you can answer this to someone else at JBL. Will the Studio 6s be available on JBL Direct? Uh, I don't believe that they will, at least as of this moment. That's certainly something that would be a decision for the sales team. But um, right now they're being rolled out to our dealer partners. So all of the initial inventory that's flowing into the U.S. right now is going to support the load in of the, the dealers right now. Right. Here, I've loved JBL. Hear the truth. Somebody, I'm not going to put this comment up. But they, <laughs> they soiled themselves, but they're happy that they have JBL products. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll skip that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. Oh, here's just another one too. Have four JBL for years. Love the sound. The love the Darth Vader look. Yeah, it kind of does look like that with the new black edition version. It's yes. pretty badass. Yeah. Uh, what other products did you want to go over that was at CES that we were unable to cover? I think uh, two other ones. We talked about the classic. So we introduced seven products at CES this year. So we had the uh, four new electronics in the classics range, which we talked about the amp, the CD player, the stream, and the turntable. The fifth one was the subwoofer here that I showed you. And then we had two more products that we announced at CES. One is the 4329P, which is the big brother to the 4305P, which was our first streaming a wireless powered loudspeaker that we introduced at CES the previous year. That went on to be one of our best selling products. It won a lot of awards as, you know, best active streaming loudspeaker out there. And we created a bigger version of it. It has all the same features and connectivity. It's twice the size. Our next step up compression driver, larger eight inch woofer. Um, it's a much more capable speaker. And it really lives in a space that there isn't anything like it right now. Most of the powered monitors, if you have a, a streaming speaker like that, are you know, four inch or five inch two way speakers. So to have a larger one that's an eight inch two way, and because it's an active design, it plays super low in the bass region down into the twenties uh, with some good output in it. So it, it, it plays oh, deep, wow. it plays loud. Uh, that's a great speaker. So we introduced that at the show and we got a couple of uh, best of awards at CES right out of the gate with that. That is now rolling out to uh, dealers across the US. Um, and then, uh, the other one is, uh, again, if I move here, mm -hmm. this is the JBL spinner BT, which was the second turntable that we introduced at the show. And whereas the classic series one is, uh, decidedly more upmarket player, it's a walnut wood chassis and aluminum tone arm, removable head shell, moving magnet cartridge comes with it, direct drive, aluminum platter, all the cool stuff but it looks very decidedly 1970s. This piece uh, we designed to bring vinyl to a new younger crowd. Um, as I think as most people know now, <clears throat> excuse me, vinyl sales have continued to grow. Uh, so what you know may have been called a fluke a few years ago, and now I guess it's a trend because it's continued for a number of years. And what we wanted to do was to bring that vinyl experience to a wider audience, a younger customer, people that have been growing up and using our portables and headphones and other things from the JBL range, this allows them to enjoy the experience of vinyl. And, you know, two parts of that, of course, the sound of vinyl, but the ritual of a physical disc that you're putting on a mechanical device and interacting with, uh, that's a very different experience. And a lot of younger uh, people that didn't grow up with it, like old guys like you and I, that grew up with, you know, tape and, records and you know predate cds in a lot of cases they're now really getting exposed to physical media and so it's a cool thing for them and it's also an element of ownership right because you have the physical content and you sure. get it like we all did you know let's read the liner notes who played on it where was it recorded what are the lyrics that cool stuff so the spinner um as a bluetooth turntable a lot of people are like well it's just a toy it's not a real player but we decidedly wanted to have a real turntable, so not a toy. It's a wooden chassis on it. It's got a, a an aluminum tone arm, a nice Audio Technica moving magnet cartridge that comes with it, a aluminum platter. It's a belt drive player, um, and from a, a preamp standpoint, it does include a phono preamp. So if you've got a product that's you know a streaming speaker or any uh, oh, okay. hi-fi system that, that, yeah, if if you don't have a phono preamp. You don't need one because it's got it. 
But the Bluetooth standpoint gives you wireless connectivity. And we did it with Aptex HD, so high res Bluetooth connectivity, so that you could get, you know, the best possible sound quality, but still have a wireless configuration. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things that you could think about again, if you're targeting a younger customer, they may be using a portable Bluetooth speaker or, you know, like one of our party boxes. And we demonstrated this at CES that way. But the more expensive products that are powered, you could use it with that. You think about sound bars, how many people that are used the sound bar as their primary audio system because they live in a smaller apartment or a smaller space. We know it's uh, it's a pretty high percentage of people. I think it's over 60% of people that use the sound bar as their music system. And you don't even turn on the TV in that respect. They've all got Bluetooth and you can connect your phone or your tablet and stream to them. Well, why not have the turntable there as well? So you could have the sound bar with your TV, turntable off to the side on a credenza sideboard, wherever you want to put it, and you could connect that way. And then with the, the portable speakers, portable Bluetooth, you know, first of all, you could connect your headphones right to the turntable or have that portable speaker there. You want to take the, the, the party outside, if you will, take the sound outside on your back deck and listen to something. You can still be connected to the turntable and listen to vinyl outdoors. So. A lot of different use cases that we saw for it, but again, really wanted to make a very premium product for this. This will be $399 in the US. It's uh targeting right now to be available for the fall selling season. And that's a uh, really reasonable price for everything yeah. that you put into that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And it, it really it's it's a good sounding player too. So again, we didn't want to make a plastic toy turntable because you know, and, and there may be a uh, a stereotype around uh, Bluetooth turntables in that respect, but this is this is a real turntable that just happens to have high res wireless connectivity in it. That's cool. Yeah, uh, a couple more comments here. I need to thank J Bill for making the Stage A one hundred and thirty such a good affordable speaker. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to possible Mark II. If so, will they be in white? <laughs> oh, there. Oh. These are things I cannot answer for you. Any color you want, as long as it's in black. <laughs> well, certainly uh, we hear you. We sh we share your uh, your thoughts and opinions there. But, you guys uh, have run. I I every now and then I look at like when you sell JBL Direct, and you do. You run these incredible sales on the Stage Series, and I don't know why we never reviewed one of these for you because that's a hell of a deal. Some of those promotions you guys run, I'm like, wow, I can't believe you could get a JBL speaker at that price. Well, and the speaker that he's mentioned in there in the stage series, that series, as I like to say, punches well above its weight. That's mm -hmm. our most affordable component loudspeaker range right now. Uh, you know, the bookshelves are just a couple hundred bucks a pair. It tops out at 900 a pair, I think is what the, the A190 is in the US. And that's a dual eight inch tower with a one inch, you know, metal dome uh, tweeter in it. That's a great sounding speaker. And if you are looking for, you know, a high value product that gives you audiophile sound on a budget, that stage series is pretty tough to beat from its performance. So is that still I, a current product or is that? Yeah, is that yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So right now we start with the stage series and then the next step up would be studio six. Although you can still find the studio five range. It's, you know, it's, it's elderly, but it is still sold on JBL.com. It's still a great product and they run some amazing deals on jbl.com right now. So if you're looking for a great loudspeaker at a really great deal, I would look at that. And then, uh, like I said, Studio 6 is really what replaced it in the range. And then HDI would be the next step up. But then if you you know shift over uh, into the other series, you can do the classic series, the studio monitor series, and all the way up to you know all our flagship speakers like the K2 and the yeah, others. Yeah, the difference so, is the classic series is really targeted for two channels. It's not really a home theater kind correct. of. Correct. Yep. Product, and yeah. And the same thing with the studio monitors. So all those <laughs> things are really two channel products. We don't make, you know, uh, center channels and whatnot. I can't say we don't make a sub because we do. <laughs> I mm -hmm. just showed it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, a lot of people like to use a sub in a music system. And especially if you do a smaller speaker, it's, it's a great way to have big sound without the big space that you're going to take up with towers. So. So here's an interesting question, and it's hard to get answers out of anybody from this. The only company that's offering direct with art is storm audio uh at least for now i know for the for a few months or so they have exclusivity that's because they have an exclusivity with it correct yes yeah so, so the fact that rcam their flagship products have you do have uh products with four independent subwoofer outputs right no uh, we do not at the moment no so oh, i thought you uh, did i thought you had one of them that did no well 
if you get up into the STP 75, you can reconfigure those things to do it. And the STP 75, I think, as most people know, is based on the trend off altitude yeah. 32 platform. Yeah. So it's much more capable than uh, what the others are. And of course, you can get much higher channel count with it too. But the standard units like the Arcam products are uh, 12 and 16 channel platforms that we have on those. And the synthesis family, we have 16 channel platforms. So we don't have um, uh, the art, the uh, room uh, correction that they're going to do in the new versions. Again, it's an exclusive with Storm right now. But um, what we do offer is, of course, Drac Live. Uh, we do it. It's included when you get a synthesis version, you get the uh, base control version of it. So the LBC comes prepaid on a synthesis product because that's just part of what we do with synthesis. You, the systems have to be calibrated. Uh, yeah. in order to achieve our performance curve in it. In the Arcam units, uh, Direct Live is included. You, if the user wants to get base control, you can do it. Um, and you could do it, you know, a multiple sub version of that. But the outputs on it, we don't have four input and outputs on it. Not many products do yet. I know there are a couple of competitive products that are coming to market that do have it. And I think you'll see that shift uh, in the market to using multiple subs. But that's something that we've done for forever and ever. Uh, and as you know, with synthesis, we've uh, been uh, uh, championing the use of twos or fours and subwoofers for quite some time and being able to independently yeah. EQ and well, you guys really you guys were really the, the, the company that emphasized the benefits of multi sub. And years ago, I'm talking 15, 20 years ago, when I started getting into multi sub, I always said we needed independent delay control for each of the subs where most calibrators were just setting it up on one delay and, and setting up their subs. I always knew that was the wrong approach. Now it's become posh or it's become, you know, popular that if you have a processor now, you need at least two subwoofer outputs with independent control. And now the, now the benchmark is getting four. So I'm glad that the industry has evolved this, which you guys already knew this. I mean, you yes. guys knew this decades ago with Todd Welty, Dr. Floyd tool, Sean Olive, you guys be, have been preaching this for decades and now it's becoming the de facto norm for everybody. And that's an awesome thing that you guys did. And I can't thank you enough for educating people on getting good base. Yeah, it's, uh, as you mentioned, it was a lot of research that the team did here and the papers that we publish. a lot of, you know, Sean and Todd are part of the Harman X corporate research group here. And a lot of pretty much everything that we do ends up being published papers, AES, these guys speak all the time. So we share that information. We want to, of course, you know, high tide raises all boats. So we want to share that with everyone. And that multiple subwoofer technology and the research then has proliferated around the industry. It's actually part of the uh, was the CEB 22 standards now that are used. And so not only does it come from the use of multiple subs, but how to properly position them in a room, because that's where you want to start get them in the right spot so that you're not burning a bunch of amp power with EQ to correct for poor placement in a room in the first place. So, And I but remember I, I remember having a conversation with Dr. Floyd Tool a long time ago, and he said the whole birth of the multi-sub thing came as a selfish thing on his part because he didn't want to put bass traps in his room. So he wanted to figure <laughs> out a way to make active <laughs> bass traps using subwoofers. And if I remember correctly, he was the one that basically asked Todd Welty to run all the math he ran MATLAB on it. He did the eigenvalue calculations, and that's how he came up with, you know, what are the benefits, where to place the subs in a rectangular room. So, I mean, this whole evolution started with someone that was looking for a practical solution because they didn't want to put these big, bulky devices in their room, and they could just tuck away a couple of subs or two or four subs. And then also, when you use multiple subs like that, you don't need to use quite as capable subs because now you've got multiple sources of base producing that content giving you, you know, synergy, even if they're not co-located, you're still getting a, a net output increase by having four subs as opposed to one. So I just think that whole evolution, that whole mindset was just brilliant how that evolved over the last couple of decades. It's great to see. And I think, you know, it eliminates one of the chief concerns that we all had for years is you have these monster subwoofers and you go into a theater and sit down and listen. And it's like, that's killer bass. And the guy beside you is like, I don't hear any bass. <laughs> so mm -hmm. all those hot spots that you would get in a room, you know, or certainly when you got to multiple seat rooms, you know, uh, even just the sofa with three, four seats in it, you could have a radically different experience in the base in the room just because of where you were sitting in the room. So it's been really nice to see the uh, changes that we've seen in a market with the uh, base response. So you get a better experience for everybody, no matter where you're sitting in the room. Yeah. And just another bit of history. I think, um, 
Infinity Prelude MTS was one of the first commercial products that actually <laughs> that actually did address bass correction. It not only did uh, it have the Raybo system, right? The Ray so, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and active <laughs> subs, active subs built into the tower that basically did... gave gave it all to you at once. Yeah, uh, Prelude MTS. I remember uh, yeah. predates me working here, but I remember seeing and listening to those systems at uh, CDS of your long ago right uh, but that was definitely one you know that's another question i'm going to put you on the spot is i used to love the brand infinity when i was in high school that was kind of the brand i i aspired to get but couldn't afford so i so i settled for jbl and that's no knock on jbl because they're both great brands um are there any plans for Harmon to kind of revitalize that brand or do you find that jbl is kind of filling the void at all price categories at this point well, JBL is the mothership brand, certainly within Harman, and we make products in every category of the company under the JBL brand. Uh, Infinity today is still uh, does very well and is very popular in the 12 volt aftermarket car audio yeah, space. Car audio. Mm -hmm. So, uh, together, I back to my old days at retail, and I ask a sound off stuff. I remember, you know, JBL and Infinity uh, cars coming through the lanes with that stuff in it. So. Um, that's where it's still offered. We also make another product that's called it's where the uh, brand is still used. And we make some battery accessories and things like that that are offered for portable products. So on the home audio side, we're not making anything under the brand currently. Um, it, there's, we've already got two speaker brands, so yeah. I don't, it's a little hard to justify having a third one, sure. uh, at this point in time. So, yeah. Well, there's always those vintage people that want to know. So I wanted to ask that question in case it came up when you're not on a live stream and I could pin you down and get an answer from you here. And understand. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool stuff. I mean, you know, Infinity was, was a, a pretty amazing band. And we think about uh, all the really old stuff that, that was made back then. It's cool stuff. So I certainly understand why there's a, a romance for it. For sure. Yeah. So did we hit all the all the major products you wanted to talk about at this time? We have covered uh, classic loudspeakers. We talked about the cool black edition. We covered our classic electronics. And again, a lot of people that are looking at the coverage of what's happening in Munich in a couple of weeks, you're going to see mm -hmm. those products from us there. Uh, we talked about the 4329, which is a new, uh, very capable, I think, one of the best powered streaming speakers out there. And then we talked about our Bluetooth turntable as well. So uh, I think we covered a whole lot of ground here. We covered some synthesis products too. So sure. And I think yeah. we have a review lined up for the sub sat system. So with that new time, I sub. believe that is the case. Yeah. So again, yeah. as I move around over here, I think what we're going to uh, get you of this little fellow right here at the L52 and yep. then this guy here, which is the L10 CS uh, classic sub. Again, that's a, that's a great pairing for those two products combined. So uh, excited to see what you guys think about it. Awesome. Well, Jim, it was great having you here. Um, I always love talking JBL and Harmon in general and finding out what you guys are cooking up. Um, I'm hoping we're going to run into each other at the Audio Advice Live event this August in Raleigh, North Carolina. I believe it's August 4th through the 6th, if I'm not mistaken. I'll be there with Audio Hawks crew. We're going to be covering that event full force. I hope you will be there as well. Yes, if and if I am not there, I know we will have a presence there. Audio Advice, a great partner of ours, and I, I know our at least some of our sales team, Chris, and some of the other guys will be down there as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Here's another uh, HDI user, 3600s and 4500 with a pair of Studio 610s. <laughs> That's, that is a tasty little system. Sure. All right, Jim. Well, I appreciate it, guys. If you like this video, please hit the thumb up, hit the subscribe button. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to me if you want to suggest video topics or ask questions. And until next time, my friends, keep listening. <laughs>